Welcome back to more Warhammer lore. In today's episode, we'll be delving once again into the Beastmen, the Cloven Ones, the true children of chaos. This time, however, we'll be focusing on the army that compromises the Beastmen, their fighting tactics, and yes, I know that tactics is almost a uh, taboo word when referring to Beastmen. And of course, I will be comparing the units and the army as a whole to what we have seen in Total War Warhammer as of the day this video has been uploaded. <laughs> as always, the information for this video will be coming from the latest army books, the Warhammer Fantasy novels, and some of the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay bestiary, as well as, of course, the Total War Warhammer video game. So with that out of the way, let's get into the army video proper, starting with how the Beastmen actually fight. Being children of chaos, and true children at that, the Beastmen abhor anything orderly, which you might think would make them a rather ineffective fighting force. And most of the time I would say it puts them at at least a disadvantage from a uh, lore standpoint. But given the right circumstances and the right war leader, and this ragtag horde of abominations will overwhelm a much more superior trained and outfitted army, through their predatory tactics and just raw savagery. Now I should say before we get too deep into this video that all followers of Chaos, and specifically the Beastmen, are often drawn and led by the Dark Powers to attack targets together. So in the lore and the novels, you will often see Beastmen being led by human champions or some other chaotic entity like a, a Dragon Ogre or a literal demon. This video will be more precise and talk more about the Beastmen and their tactics when fighting solo against other herds or anyone else. While Beastmen in general would be rather instinctual in their tactics, similar to how wolves coordinate taking down prey, a good war leader would take advantage of the bestial nature of his troops and deploy them as to give them the most benefits to their attack patterns. Meaning, uh, Beastmen are damn near the best, or one of the best, ambushers in Warhammer. In Tabletop, they had special rules that would allow certain units to deploy behind or flanking the enemy army, setting up one hell of a massacre. If it worked out the way it was supposed to. As even setting up simple ambushes can be a challenge when the chaotic nature of these entities really grinds with following even basic orders. It takes a very powerful war chief to keep them in line and keep them from acting on their own when not in his presence. For instance, a column of man things could be marching close to one of the beastmen hunting grounds and find themselves set up for a complete surprise attack. An entire regiment of Senegors is hidden out of view on the other side of the hill, while the main body of the beastmen troops are to come charging out of the woods drawing the attention of the Man-Things in a conflict that they will certainly lose without the aid of their hidden troops. So the Beastmen charge out screaming, uh, well, brain, at the enemy, and proceed to get massacred, as the Centigors were true drunk or simply did not give a crap about what the war leader had said because he isn't there to make sure they actually do what they're supposed to. And so the ambush turns into a full rout and the Beastmen are butchered wholesale as they flee the Lesser Man things <laughs> and escape deeper into the woods. These such instances play out time and time again to the Beastmen, as the greatest enemy of them is in fact their selves, more specifically their uh, chaotic nature. As they embrace chaos and are a spawn of it, they are almost inept at coordinated assaults when not led by a very gifted war leader. But when all the pieces actually fall into place, they are a steamroller of an army. Since beastmen are physically superior to humans in nearly every way, save for intelligence, <laughs> they can easily overwhelm most enemies with their animal ferocity. Also, due to the same principle when attacking, what would be considered uh, regiments of beastmen do not attack in a standard formation, with some very few exceptions. They are more of a loose gathering of warriors given an objective, which means that they move much quicker through even rough terrain, but also means they are highly susceptible to breaking and fleeing, as there's very little holding each piece of the army together. 
This represents itself as the Beastmen, despite having massive numbers, as being a faction with all around low leadership when compared to other factions. Now I'm not saying everything has low leadership, but what would make up the bulk of the Beastmen are an elite army, mainly um, Ungors and some, even some of the Gores, have relatively low leadership for what they are as frontline troops. Which means that if an attack isn't going exactly as planned, or you have some kind of leadership individual keeping each piece of the battlefield under watch, there's a very high chance the War Horde will break in a situation that it would or should grind out if they were to stay fighting in the long run. But of course, they don't know that, and that is the greatest weakness of most of the Beastmen. That animal cunning is only so useful until it isn't. <laughs> Which brings us full circle into the abhorrence of order and the desire to tear it down and defile it. Nothing upsets a beastman more than a man-thing town or village, and they will do their damnedest to crush it and eat the inhabitants. Because of this, every single settlement of any race that has beastmen nearby will have some kind of walls which exploits another weakness of the Beastmen. They do have quite a few, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. As they are known for their ability, um, not their ability to create things. So making siege equipment is completely and utterly out of the question. Outside of um, perhaps lashing together some very questionable ladders and perhaps using a tree as a battering ram, meaning that sieges are not exactly the strong suit of the Beastmen. In fact, a siege plays completely against their tactics of ambush and numbers, as an entire herd has been known to be completely decimated by a relatively small number of defenders, as the Beastmen, being themselves, tend to just run up to the wall screaming, where they are picked off by arrow fire and handguns before they even reach the wall. And hell, once they even do, if their ladder doesn't fall apart, their initial numbers are usually so thinned that they turn tail and run. <laughs> Which means that sieges, successful sieges, will rely on a quick attack to either rush in so fast that the defenders have no time to react, or the walls need to be penetrated by some of the more rare units in the Beastmen roster that they can call upon from the uh, darker places. And that is actually one of the blessings of the Beastmen in that they are gifted with a rather large amount of massive monsters that can turn the blundering tide of the average gore and ungore all on their own. Now I think I have rambled on long enough by the hypothetical tactics and situations, so let's actually get into the Beastmen roster starting with the infantry. Now I have discussed in much more depth most of this roster in my previous Beastmen lore videos. So feel free to check out my society video and my Minotaur video for more details on some of the units mentioned in those. The first infantry unit to make an appearance is the Ungors. These are beastmen that have small little nubs of horns on their heads, or perhaps no horns at all, making them almost the lowest class of being in the herd. Almost. They are also one of the most numerous of beastmen kind, and so are often used as fodder troops. <laughs> Or at least they should be. For the most part, they are smaller and weaker than your average gore, and so typically they don't even make it to the front lines fast enough to beat the gores in battle. Meaning that they often are more of a supporting role, jabbing spears and swinging axes between their larger brethren, and in general keeping the enemy on their toes. In Total War, we get technically three versions of the Ungors. In the Ungors with Spears, and spear and shields, which as you can guess are anti-large and one of the only anti-large units in the Beastmen roster, making them actually pivotal to taking on factions that bring a lot of monsters, like other Beastmen or Blizzardmen. <laughs> and we get the Ungors with hand axes and shields, which have stalk, meaning that they can move undetected from enemies until they get a certain distance from them, making them surprisingly good for setting up ambushes as they have pretty decent speed as well. But the Ungors suffer from some of the uh, lowest leadership in the game, and their combat stats, while decent, are not the best. So if they get caught out without any support, and they can't surprise their ambush exactly how they planned, it's pretty much all over. <laughs> so there is that. 
Then we come to the Gores, which technically are said to be the most common type of beastmen, but I still think that the Ungores would be more numerous just due to the nature of chaos and how most beastmen born have got to have some severe mutations that would discredit them for gore status, but the army book does state that gores are the most common and numerous of the beastmen. Easily distinguished from their smaller kin, the ungore, gores are marked by prominent horns that jut from atop their shaggy heads. For a gore, the possession of a large set of horns grants it an immediate and tangible mark that donates rank and status amongst the herd. In fact, the possession of a set of curling or straight horns is the very definition of what denotes a particular beastman as a gore. Now, gores are actually one of the few types of beastmen that are capable of some discipline, as they actually do march in a somewhat regimented fashion and are known to actually even fly banners. The war leader would use his gores wisely to make sure uh, key defenses are breached or pivotal parts of an ambush are carried out as the gores are one of the few units that are disciplined enough to actually take orders and usually carry them out without giving in to their animal bloodlust for the most part. In Total War we get uh, two flavors of gores. The first has a shield making them excellent frontline troops if you aren't going up against um, anything with armor as they severely lack in the armor department. But you do have some rather high stats to compensate. Um, then we get the dual wielding variety which as you guess deals out a very large amount of damage quickly with the sacrifice of a shield. And they also do get vanguard deployment I think to represent that they are usually the first into combat at least in the lore. And lack of armor is pretty much a common um, trait of all beastmen, <laughs> just about. Except for the last of what I consider the normal infantry in the Bestigors, or Beastigors. There's no A. I, I say Bestigor. So if you don't like it, I apologize. Kind of. <laughs> Which are the most elite versions of Gores in the tribe, so they're technically still Gores. Their horns are larger and more ornate than your average gore, as well as they tend to be more physically capable and much more disciplined to boot. These elite troops form a bodyguard unit for the warchief, as well as a able-bodied and dependable shock troop that can easily match elite infantry from other factions, as bestigors have the almost an innate desire to prove that they are the strongest and favored by their dark gods. Also, for this reason, an intelligent war chief would keep an eye on his bestigor and make sure he doesn't see any of his elite's horns growing um, more ornate or larger or their bulk increasing, as this could indicate a, uh, a new rival for leadership of the herd, as most war leaders won their title by striking down the previous leader, usually in a uh, very weakened state. <laughs> As Bestigors are the elite troops of the tribe, they are afforded the best equipment available. Which means that Bestigors are the only heavily armored standard troops available to the beastmen. As they scavenge armor from the lesser races and beat the plates and mail into a shape that will adorn their grotesque forms. They also do tend to wear chainmail hoods and shirts under their hodgepodge armor. Now, in the lore, Bestigors can be seen wielding an assortment of weapons similar to all beastmen in general. But for the army book, they are said to typically favor a two-handed great axe of pretty good quality, probably stolen from some long-dead man-things of perhaps a forgotten age, and they are exceptionally deadly. In Total War, the Bestigors perform very similar, as they do in tabletop, as highly armored, fast for elite troops, armor-piercing monstrosities that can go ahead and go head-to-head -head with any elite troops from the most factions and still come out on top. A very cost-efficient investment, especially if you are facing a faction with a lot of armor. And that's about it for the standard infantry. And then we move on to the missile units, and there is only one <laughs> in the Beastman roster. They are the Ungor Raiders, which are much more of an interesting unit in the lore, at least. They are essentially Ungors with very crude short bows, 
In the lore, they are the hunters and rangers for the herd that scout ahead to inform the Beast Lord of notable terrain or enemies in their vicinity. Of course, if they happen to come across a small band of potential prey, they are also known to engage these enemies and hopefully slaughter and loot them before the Beast Lord knows what is happening and is none the wiser. But if they take too long or wars are routed, the punishments that a Beast Lord doles out are not exactly lenient, and most of the surviving raiders will find themselves dead anyway. But just like all Beastmen, despite the consequences looming overhead, they more often give in to their impulses and do more than just scouting. Now, in a full-on battle or ambush, Ungor Raiders are known to charge ahead and loose a volley or two from their shoddy bows into the enemy and then retreat through the approaching gores to pepper their foes from a distance. A rather short distance, but a distance nonetheless. In Total War, Ungor Raiders are one of the technically only three ranged units, which makes them invaluable when you just need a unit to keep some cavalry honest or attempt to whittle down a large target but their bows are of very poor quality and overall one of the weakest ranged infantry in the game with a rather rather exceptionally small range <laughs> so they're not that effective um, against very large armies and they can not easily be counter skirmished making them not good against anything that has very long decent um, skirmishing capabilities. And now we get into the monstrous infantry starting off with the Minotaurs. Now I comprised an entire video on Minotaurs so if you want more detailed information on them I would suggest watching my previous lore video. As far as battle is concerned Minotaurs are hard-hitting shock infantry with mass the equivalent of cavalry which is appropriate as the average Minotaur is probably 8 to 10 feet tall. Now when it comes to weaponry, the army book simply says that the Minotaurs usually pick the largest and most formidable weapons from the Hearthstones to take to battle. Meaning they don't necessarily have a uniform type of weapon. In the various models for tabletop, we see examples of Minotaurs dual wielding axes or an axe and a mace or a Minotaur with a great hammer or a great axe and we even have Minotaurs with an axe and shield. Now, in Total War, CAH has decided to split the Minotaurs into three different varieties to help alleviate some of the more obvious weaknesses of the Beastmen. We get the standard Minotaur, which dual wields axes. They have the highest melee attack and do pretty decent armor piercing damage. They are most useful in taking on your average low to mid grade infantry as all Minotaurs inspire fear in between their massive charge bonus and their damage dealing potential the standard Minotaur can devastate an entire average block of infantry but they are highly susceptible to ranged fire as they have almost no armor. So that brings us to the shielded variety which has slightly less melee attack but has a shield to block incoming missiles and still has an armor piercing property. These monsters will stay in combat much longer due to their defensive buffs but not put out as much damage making them a decent holding unit or a decent quick flanker if they are not completely focused down before they enter combat which is an ins a big issue for all the monstrous creatures in any roster and the final variety of minotaur is a two-handed great axe which does massive armor piercing damage and they are one of not many other units as an anti-large uh, capable unit besides the Ungor Spears and I think the Centigors with Great Weapons are the other ones which in and of itself makes the um, the oh gosh the Minotaur with Great Weapons highly useful as they are pretty much your answer to any kind of heavy cavalry or heavily armored monsters that they can catch and that is the key they are not very fast. They're faster than your average troop, but not fast even to catch up with heavy cavalry. They could probably still outrun them. So if you can get them slowed down and engaged somehow, they will butcher heavy cavalry and other large monsters. So, But all Minotaurs are also extremely expensive, and so they can't be brought in like really massive numbers, unless you're playing campaign. <laughs> 
The next unit in this category would be the Effort Lovable Chaos Spawn, which is a recurring unit in most Chaos Faction rosters. A Chaos Spawn is essentially a mutant that has gone well past the point of being recognizable as a normal living thing. They are embodiments of chaos and a warning to those who desire the power of the Dark Gods, as the very gifts that were bestowed upon them are what has turned them into writhing masses of flesh, tentacles, and bone, and mouths, and just disgusting. A chaos spawn is actually does not have a single generic appearance. Each one is actually unique, but they are all horrendous abominations that should inspire fear in the hearts of all mortals. Chaos spawn are actually beyond the control of any army, not led by what I would say a greater demon or something of that equivalent. It is not exactly said how these creatures are rallied by the beastmen, but I would assume they used to be beastmen, <laughs> and so they are contained much in the same way as other wild beasts are for war, and are let loose near the enemy or dominated and guided by a brave shaman to give them direction. Now, in Total War, Chaos Spawn, specifically the beastmen versions, are highly effective at tearing through unarmored infantry. They have a high weapon damage and will fight to the death as their minds have been twisted and lost long ago. But they lack the armor piercing of any armor of their own <laughs> to stand up to ranged fire or elite infantry and certainly not cavalry or other monsters. Meaning that they are a very highly damaging unit, but a very squishy unit. Now, the Beastman version differs from the kind found in the normal Warriors of Chaos roster in that it also inflicts poison damage, actually making them very effective as a frontline supporting monster that can, you can charge in behind your frontline after they soak up the charge to aid them in actually tearing down whatever they're fighting even if it's a more elite unit, because the poison will degrade their stats, and hopefully, through the combination of the Chaos Spawn and whatever you have fighting this other unit, you can pull them down and create a gap to funnel more troops through. This moves us out of monstrous infantry and into what I would consider the cavalry for the Beastmen, which gets a little fudged when talking about them specifically. Um, the first on my list would be the Chaos Warhounds. Now, Chaos Warhounds are a staple in almost any Chaos army, but they have a special place in the Beastmen army as they are raised and trained by the Beastmen in the same way a human would train a hunting dog. The exception being that these dogs are as large as a man, <laughs> with hideous mutations ranging from horns and spiked appendages to extra limbs and tentacles or even rock hard scales and human looking faces. <laughs> they are beyond hideous and a perfect fit for the war hard as they also have a craving for man flesh, specifically making it easy to train them to hunt man things in the forest. Of course being pure of chaos they can never be completely trained but they can have some control exerted over them by their handlers. The strengths of these Warhounds are that they are ridiculously fast, making them excellent for flanking maneuvers or finishing off a routing enemy. In Total War, we see Chaos Warhounds in two varieties for the Beastmen. You have the Standard Warhound, and then you have the Poisoned Warhound. That not only combines speed and potential, damage, but uh, makes an excellent support unit in any situation as the poison will weaken any nearby enemies and allow your inferior beasts to rip apart those empire knights and then successfully hunt them down with their reduced movement as warhounds are very fast. Probably one of the most fast you ground based units. The only thing that could probably outrun them would be something that is flying. And speaking of flying, next on the list we have the Harpies. Now, I have also gone over Harpies in some of my previous lore videos, and not much has changed. There are still Harpies. They are feral creatures with the shape and form of a woman with wings, fangs, and 
very um, uncouth looking claws. <laughs> They are much more animal in nature, and for this reason they do tend to dwell near Hearthstones and the hunting grounds of beastmen, perhaps drawn uh, by their chaos energy, or the land, or perhaps the large amounts of blood and rotten flesh left behind in their wake. Either way, they kind of, they tend to stay together in, um, I guess flocks is what you would call them. <laughs> Big nests is that they make in nearby caves. Either way, it is a common sight to see harpies following around a herd to gorge themselves on the remnants of a battle. And not just the enemies of the beastmen, they do eat the beastmen as well. <laughs> so, of course these feral creatures can be given some direction by a Bray Shaman, and utilized for quick strikes and flanking maneuvers not normally possible by the mostly ground-based roster of the beastmen. Now, they are relatively unremarkable <laughs> in Total War. They're pretty much just a cheap flying unit and not much else. They're best put to use absorbing missile fire, soaking up charges, and occasionally attempting to quickly break an enemy through flanking maneuvers, though that's even that is uh, hard to do. They don't last long in combat. But what they do succeed at is punishing skirmishers that aren't guarded, as well as chasing enemies off the field routing units because with their high speeds as they're flying they can easily catch up to anything and they're able to successfully route off a much more difficult opponent that they shouldn't be able to actually uh, take care of but they do serve that function much in the same way as the warhounds and next are the razor gores these are massive mutated boars about the size of a bear <laughs> they are twisted and obviously touched by chaos as they have developed thick almost uh, armor like hide and their hair has become something more akin to metal hence the name razor gore they also seem to be sprouting tusks and spines from various places they shouldn't as well as have an unnatural hostility towards all forms of life including the beastmen whom they often kill and eat chewing them like a cow chews grass so, a great image. Some tribes, the braver ones at least, are known to capture and direct razor gores towards the enemy. Now, they cannot exactly be controlled afterwards, and hopefully they are all dead, and hopefully took a lot of the enemy with them, because after the battle, they are known to once again go into their blood frenzy and feast on their captors, as well as the enemy. In Total War, the razor gores are a odd unit I would say. They're somewhat slow as they are kind of almost a heavy cavalry and they are armor piercing which is good but unfortunately they have very low leadership and can easily be picked off by skirmishers before ever making it into combat which makes microing them very intensive and in general just not worth the cost in most matchups. Though they do excel at smashing through dwarfs I will say that and destroying their usually hardy low tier troops until they come up with something a little more um, unforgiving and then they're just useless so for the most part they're not the best but uh, I guess you could make them work in certain builds next for cavalry we have the tusk gore and razor gore chariots now the beastmen are not exactly the most uh, industrious individuals and so the very very few war machines they do build are of the most terrible construction. <laughs> These ramshackle chariots are barely more than some wood bolted together and don't even know how it's holding in place as it's pulled by these massive beasts. In fact, in tabletop, there was actually a chance that the Tuscor chariot could simply just fall apart after colliding with an enemy as the construction was that bad. Now, Tusk Gores are just a kind of like a smaller version of a Razor Gore without the um, metal spiky bits. Um, they often are used to pull chariots uh, by these. Uh, would reflect that being smaller and while still devastating, just not as effective. The Razor Gore chariot, however, is a very different story. Razor Gore chariots are actually a possible mount choice for your Beast Lord. 
and so are built much more sturdily than the tusk ore variety and are usually pulled by one massive razor gore. We're talking something about the size of like a, like a small peasant house. It's that big. So you can assume the impact would be devastating and being led by either a beast lord or a chariot team, they're very effective at breaking a line. In Total War, these serve as the, the same function they do in tabletop. They come in small numbers, but are hard hitting and excellent for breaking up a front line and pushing through to those skirmishers. However, just like all chariots in Total War, they require a lot of micro to keep them safe and constantly moving as they will fall rather dramatically in hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> Even against low-tier troops, they will not do well. So they're meant for hit-and-run tactics, which makes them good in the hands of a master and dangerous in the hands of anybody who thinks they are somewhat decent, like myself. <laughs> so there's that. The last and most cavalry-like of the Beastmen is, of course, the Centigors. Now, I have also talked about these creatures in some detail in my past videos, but for those of you who don't realize it by now, Centigors are essentially centaurs of mythology, and similar to Minotaurs and Warhammer, are almost a separate species or subspecies of beastmen that can usually be found kind of on their own. They form their own wandering war bands, essentially. But they will heed the call of the Bray Shamans and join their smaller brethren in battle. Now, the Centigors of Warhammer are much larger than your average beastmen. They appear to be crossed either with a large warhorse or an ox and a human, making them very physically imposing and capable of wielding very heavy crude weapons as they are not known for their dexterity. In addition to the cruel and violent temperament, <laughs> Centigors are infamous for being known as drunkards. In fact, it is not uncommon for Centigors to attack a heavily defended column or storehouse to get a hold of high quality booze, which they will then gorge themselves on that night and inevitably wake up with a hangover and start this process all over again. Perhaps because of this behavior, it is not uncommon for Bray Shamans to utilize Centigors as messengers to other herds, not just their speed, but also this specific um, quirk that they have as the message is given to the slow-witted and inebriated creature and then upon said creature's arrival at the other herd or horde stone or whoever it while it is intoxicated the message is surprisingly relayed as if the bray shaman was reciting it themselves either with the bray shaman's voice <laughs> which is unusual or you know i did i i Identically to what the Bray Shaman said, but coming out of the Centigore's mouth. Or sometimes, uh, an even more distant and dark voice will spill forth through the messenger, relaying not only a message, but perhaps even a prophecy, further insinuating that Centigores can possibly commune with their base nature, and therefore the Chaos Gods, while in their drunken state. Now, in Total War, we get three varieties of Centigores, similar to the Minotaurs. And that communing that I was just talking about is more of a um, speculation on my part, part because the Minotaurs have a similar quirk about them when they eat. They uh, actually kind of commune with their gods. It's almost seen as worship. So that's where I'm getting that from. But we do get a standard spear and shield variety, which is actually pretty decent as a kind of uh, medium cavalry except they have very low armor and therefore can't soak up a lot of damage from skirmishers even though they have shields and definitely can't go head to head with heavy cavalry. Then we get Centigors with throwing axes which kind of goes against the lore as Centigors are supposed to be uh, kind of clumsy creatures but Beastmen, they need some range and the armor piercing axes are extremely useful for peppering down heavy cavalry and monsters that the Beastmen would not have access to otherwise. And then that brings us to the Centigors with Great Weapons, a personal favorite of mine, as they are armor-piercing and anti-large, making them ideal for hunting enemy cavalry on paper, at least. Unfortunately, their low armor makes them more likely for a 
trade instead of uh, actually beating a unit that they should be able to beat. Except when aided by Poison Warhounds, which then in conjunction will allow them to tear through multiple cavalry engagements if you are smart and time it properly, making them a very diverse and um, useful unit on the battlefield. And that about wraps it up the cavalry, so now we are moving into the actual monsters of the Beastmen roster, which you could include some of the others we have previously discussed. But these are what I consider the true monsters the Cloven Ones can bring to the field. The first two being the Gorgon and the Cygor. Now, I have gone over these in great detail in my Minotaur lore video, so for more information, please see that video. As far as the Cygor, they are a type of Minotaur, cursed in the long distant past, and changed to about the size of a giant and doomed to see the world through the winds of magic or the realms of chaos, if pick or choose, making them crazy and graving the very souls of their enemies. They hurl large magical stones they pick up from ruins and other various sources to crush their enemies before closing with them and we're going down their souls. So, in Total War, they are all the only extreme long-range option that the Beastmen have for dealing damage, and the damage they inflict is massive. They are exceptional at taking out large clusters of highly armored troops, or for smashing walls, towers, and gates during a siege. Now, Gorgons, on the other hand, are four-armed, giant-sized also related to minotaurs, with multiple mouths and an insatiable hunger for fresh meat. Unfortunately, they have yet to make it into Total War. I know, it's sad. I suspect this could be because they kind of serve a similar function to the already included Chaos Giant, but with that being said, if CA wanted to add them, I could see them as more of a anti-large version of the Giant. As in the lore, they specifically try and eat large creatures, so they could make that work if they wanted to, but that's, you know, that's up in the air. They are probably working on other factions right now, and of course the next game, so who knows if we'll ever see it, but if we do, that would be an awesome inclusion as far as the Gorgon is concerned. The next monster would be the aforementioned Chaos Giant. Now, Chaos Giants are a form of giant that has been corrupted by the Dark Powers, imbuing them with a need to seek out and serve the whims of Chaos. These giants are more prone to fits of violence and rage than your average, which is saying something, and they actively seek out battle as much out of a desire to feed, but also just simply to kill things. Much like many of the other monsters employed by the Beastmen, the Chaos Giants' will is mostly their own. The Bray Shamans can convey basic orders, but inevitably, once the killing starts, the Chaos Giant is going to simply murder and maim as it pleases, <laughs> often plucking up the unfortunate enemy and storing him in a rather uncomfortable place for later as a snack. So, yeah. In Total War, the Chaos Giant is the same as any other giant, really. He has a giant club, it's great for taking out walls and doors during the siege, and actually does pretty well against heavy cavalry and even heavy infantry, as long as they aren't anti-large. However, the Beastman variety is given a little flair, as the Chaos Giant is blessed with a beautiful coat of fur covering his body and two very large horns sprouting from his head, just to distinguish him from the other giants, but as far as paper is concerned, the Chaos Giant of the Beastmen is the same giant from all the other factions you see. And then we have the final monster of the Beastmen, probably one of the most iconic in the Jabber Slice. Now, Jabber Slice are amongst the most ancient and foul of all the creatures of the deep forest of the old world. They are truly repugnant to look upon, having such grotesque and twisted features that even the clearest pools of water will not offer up their reflection. A sickening fusion of toad, kind of a sludge drake and many-limbed insect, the Jabber Slythe encompasses all that is unwholesome and vile about nature and magnifies it hundredfold. Ugh. The ungainly and clumsy creatures, Jabber Slice have mutated the better to catch agile prey such as sprites that buzz around their lairs or the occasional ungore who strays a little too close. 
They have a thick, sticky proboscis like tongue, and they can shoot it out in the blink of an eye, capable of ensnaring and pulling a creature as large as a horse into the Jabber Slide's gaping maw when it retracts. But the most horrendous of all the Jabber Slice weapons is actually its appearance. The creature is so unsightly, a monster so disturbing to look upon, that an aura of madness surrounds it. There is something so unearthly and unsettling about this beast that even to set eyes upon it is to go immediately and permanently insane. So to gauge it's such a being is to tempt fate, for many who do have their sanity ripped asunder. It is said that a jabber slithe is so horrible to view that even clear pools of water will not offer up their reflection, hence why they can't see themselves. <laughs> Those that look upon a jabber slithe for too long find themselves clawing out their own eyes, crawling in tight circles, babbling nonsensical rhymes and gibberish tongue, shrieking with manic laughter, or even gutting themselves with their own weapons in their desperation to escape the nightmare's vision that has seared itself into their brains, forever haunting them. These unfortunates are easy prey for the Jlaber Slythe, which will lumber towards its hapless victims with acidic drool spilling from upturned corners of its fane ridge maw. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a scary, scary thing. <laughs> now, Jabber Slice are lured into battle by the drums of the Beastmen and given direction by Bray Shamans. The Beastmen are not immune to its madness, however, and must keep their distance lest they be ensnared in the same madness they wish to see upon their enemies. Of course, it takes an exceptionally powerful Bray Shaman to control such a creature, and so them joining a war herd is rare, but plausible. Unfortunately, much like the Gorgon, the Jabber Slythe did not make the cut in the Total War. If it is ever included, which I do hope it is, that is, it is iconic. I could see it implemented similarly to a Mortis engine, and that its aura would twist those around it into madness, causing um, essentially degrading their health to over time, and maybe even give it a debuff to leadership or something of that nature to nearby units and maybe even nearby beastmen since it's supposed to affect them. That would be one way, but I'm sure there are plenty other ways you guys could probably think up um, that could be implemented to make them work. I would love to see it just because it's like a giant like Lovecraftian monster, essentially is what it is. And yes, I enjoy it very, very much. And that actually is the roster from the armies for the Beastmen. Now, in Total War, we actually did get the inclusion of Manticores into the Beastmen roster because they just needed that little extra push. They needed something. And Manticores are okay. They're not the greatest, but they do kind of replace um, Harpies for the Beastmen in a fast unit, but that causes terror. So it's even better at helping route those enemies that the beastmen really need. They need enemies to route quickly, otherwise they will be destroyed. So we do get those as far as that is concerned. I have done workups on Manticores in my Dark Elves video, so go check that one out. I believe I did. I'm almost positive. If I didn't, I apologize, and I'll put one up sometime. <laughs> so that is going to be it for the actual units as far as the army composition is concerned. And since we closed out the unit roster, now we move into the actual heroes. And for the most part, we have already covered these in my previous videos. So let's gloss over them quickly. We have Gorbals, which are just bigger, badder minotaurs, essentially. Often champions of the tribe and very, very dangerous. Plus, they are heavily armored. In Total War, Gorbals serve almost the same role as an Empire Captain keeping leadership up for nearby allies and imbuing some interesting buffs to the war horde through their skill tree in the campaign. Then we have the Bray Shamans, the magic casters for the Beastmen, which come in the form of the Lord of Beasts, Shadow, Death, and the Wilds. They are surprisingly powerful for being of the lower beastly nature and are a communing vessel for the Beastmen and the Dark Gods. In Total War, they function just as a basic caster and lend some much needed magical support to your war horde. Then we have the War Gores, which actually did not make an appearance in Warhammer. They are essentially the further upper leaders of the Bestigors, 
making them almost something more similar to an Empire Captain, but unfortunately that role is already filled by the Gorbel. And so if they were ever to be included, um, I would see them almost as a warrior priest. And just hold that for a second, hold that thought. As most of these creatures are said to be favored by the Dark Gods. And so if CA really wanted to implement War Gores and add another hero class to the Beastmen, they could do it as in, I don't know, maybe you have a war gore of corn or a war gore of zinch or something and they give different benefits to the herd and possibly different abilities. I don't know. Like, the sky's the limit. So CA has proven that they could, they could handle it if they really wanted to. And I'd love to see a little more diversity because right now you just have gore bulls and brace shamans. That's it. That's all you get. And so it would be nice to have um, just another option. And this leads us into the actual leaders of the Beastmen in their board choices. Now, there are far more choices in Tabletop than we get in Warhammer. But that could change, much like it did for the Dark Elves recently. We currently have access to the Beast Lord, which in Tabletop would be your average Lord choice. In the lore, at least, they are made to sound much more powerful and cryptic, as they all bear marks of chaos, and due to the nature of the Beastmen, each are an expert in one-on-one -on -one combat, making them ideal for hunting enemy lords and heroes. Unfortunately, they are definitely not this in Total War, <laughs> which kind of sucks, as instead you are forced to rely on Gorbals to try and assassinate uh, enemy heroes or you know other lords. And the Beastmen just don't have the capacity, they don't have any assassin-like heroes in their roster. And we don't have access to the Doom Bulls either, which are basically just girl bulls on steroids for leading armies. Or Brace Shamans that actually lead tribes. This is in the lore, this is in the tabletop. I don't know why we don't have it. <laughs> now, either of these choices could easily be implemented later with very little effort, in my opinion, as far as the, um, the Doom Bulls and the Brace Shamans. CA has proven that they know how to work with what they've already established and make something unique and more appropriate without breaking the game. I'm actually kind of surprised that we don't have the Brace Shamans, honestly, uh, as a leader right now because it would be the easiest lord to implement and it would just make sense, but uh, I'm not a game designer. Perhaps it is harder than I think. It probably is. Or maybe they're just busy with other projects and one day we will actually get the update to the Beastmen that they do deserve in my humble, humble opinion. Now, on a whole, the Beastmen are a fast, ambush-focused melee army with huge monsters and feral superiority to your average faction. But they do lack in leadership and most of all, armor, <laughs> making them also one of the squishiest armies as well. They're still one of my favorite races in Warhammer, period. And with that said, I think it's about time to wrap up this army video on the Beastmen. I hope I didn't miss anything. If I did, I'm sure you will notify me in the comments section. And thank you guys for sticking around this long if you have made it all the way to me making the closing arguments. Also, if you are new to the channel, feel free to both like this video and subscribe to the channel for future content. It really does help me out. It helps get the word out about the channel, helps me still put in the effort to make more videos because I mean, I'm not exactly making money on this stuff. So it's all kind of, if you guys want it, I'll do it. If you guys get bored of it, I'll just move on to something else. <laughs> so if you guys like it, let me know in the comments section. So we'll, we'll keep powering through. I've got a good idea of what the next factions will be, but um, that really doesn't matter right now. So <laughs> as usual, guys, I would like to say thank you to all my loyal subscribers. You guys have been awesome. We have a good community here, not, a, not too many trolls. They slip in every now and then, <laughs> but for the most part, everybody's really positive and very, um, very understanding, so I appreciate that, guys, and I don't tell you guys enough that I uh, I enjoy the small fan base that we have, so I would like to say that's been it, guys. I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you guys all again in another video. Have a good day.